This is Dr. Gooden. I'll be talking about needs and motivation next. This is the second um, video. Um, what is motivation? It's an internal state that arouses, directs, and maintains behavior. All right, so it arouses us. It gets us excited. It, it opens our eyes. It it gives us um, goosebumps on our skin. It gets blood pumping through our brain, or through through our veins. Sorry, it it directs us. It tells us where to put all that energy, or where to put our. It doesn't create energy, but it gets the energy ready. It arouses it and then directs that energy, and it keeps it going. It maintains that energy toward whatever behavior we need. To, to do. Um, so think of a behavior you, you need to do. Um, everything you do comes from two places. We're not really going to talk about the other one, but it's either out of motivation or it's out of something called volition. Okay? Volition. V O L I T I O N. Volition means you're doing something without being motivated you're doing it because you have to um, just because you know it should be done but there's no internal or external arousal um, of, of energy toward it that is volition most things we do in life are motivated either internally which would be intrinsic motivation or externally, which is called extrinsic motivation. What types of things interfere with your motivation to learn course material? Well, you, um, uh, a teacher who is not good or doesn't know their content, um, that would interfere. Your lack of interest in the course material would also do it. Um, think of other things. And then what needs do you have Sometimes it's a need that needs to be met that actually motivates us. Our behavior is is meant to fulfill a need. I need to make more than minimum wage. So I'm going to go to college. I'm motivated to go to college. I'm motivated to take these courses and tests so that I can get a degree so that I will make more than minimum wage, hopefully. What needs motivate you for each behavior? Um, that you perform. We're going to look at this guy, Abraham Maslow. He was one of the first people to really think about what motivates us. Um, he was born in Brooklyn, first of seven children. Parents were uneducated Jewish immigrants from Russia. He had a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD, all in psychology um, from the University of Wisconsin. Now, you're not going to be tested on that, but We'll give the guy a little credit and, and talk about him for a moment. Um, he observed that all needs are not equal. Okay, if a man is very hungry and very thirsty, he will satisfy his thirst before doing anything else. Because one can live longer without food than without water. So we're going to go for thirst before um, hunger. If we're thirsty and being choked, we will try to breathe rather than seek water. Um, so there is sort of a hierarchy of needs, right? That's exactly what he's talking about. And, and he talked about that. Um, I'll give you this example. Um, and we think about this as you're starting to try to apply this information to possible students or, or anyone that is learning from you or as you were learning. Um, I had a student, I worked in a mental health facility um, for a while and I had a student um, who's, uh, we, we worked with a lot of students from difficult home environments. The student's mother wanted to go on dates at night and didn't have a babysitter and so she would drop him off. This is a, a, a preteen, he was maybe 10 drop him off at Walmart for the night. Of course, Walmart is often open 24-7. Um, now, he would end up sleeping in the corner of 
uh, the Walmart store. And then he would he would get bussed um, to us the next day. Um, his mom would come back and get him after her her night of dating, um, we'll call it, and and he would get sent to us to to learn. It was a mental health facility, but we had um, a school um, to to satisfy their uh, obvious um, educational needs. So really what we had to start with each day is we'll call him Ralph that's not his name but we'll call him Ralph say Ralph have you eaten anything as Ralph had slept on the floor in the corner of a Walmart had probably not not normally had breakfast uh, not had many of his needs met um, during the night um, and so he came to us not wanting to learn his English or his math is hungry and really sleepy so he'd been sleeping on the floor or trying to um, it's those needs that we need to take into account with our students and understand that if their home needs aren't being met if they don't feel connected and comfortable if they feel scared um, if some of their more primal more root needs are not met then they're not going to come into our class motivated to learn the content that we often present really dryly without making it fun, without making it exciting, and even if we were to give Ralph this fun, exciting information, he still has some some needs that should be met first. So think about that as we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow wanted a theory that could account for the positive aspects of mankind. He was looking for good things. He's, he said, what about curiosity? What about when people do things, altruistic things? Um, they do things without expecting a reward in return. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, um, give my seat up to um, uh, an elderly woman on the, on the train. Maslow said, I was awfully curious to find out why I didn't go insane. All right. And he came up with with this uh, initially um, two levels were added later but we'll take a look here at this self-actualization esteem needs belongingness and love needs safety needs and then the very basic needs we have to meet these first at the bottom basic life needs air food drink shelter warmth sex sleep what do you what do you think sex are some of these more important than the others I would say so some of these we can live without, um, unfortunately. Sometimes I go without sleep, but I think it's probably um, air, food, drink, shelter, sleep. Um, but these are more of the primal things that we need. And then we, we get into just needs for, for safety, um, where, where people, if they don't feel protected, um, you know that's that's an issue they need to feel secure um, there needs to be a sense of order around them there need to be some laws and limits at least some guidelines for what to do some stability um, think about Ralph and and his home and the the fact that maybe he was getting air maybe he was getting food or drink maybe there was shelter but was it protected was it secure orderly stable no he was just kinda of getting thrown around from place to place um, and a higher order need than that is belongingness and love needs the, the, the idea that we need uh, family we need to feel affection we need to be in relationships um, if, if, if nothing else just a puppy right um, or a neighbor um, somebody that we can connect to um, um, even even going to work sometimes gives us um, somebody to relate to and we have our work family and we have esteem needs um, esteem needs are this is this is reaching um, a, a more personal level of I need to feel good about myself this is where my self-concept and my self-esteem come from I have achieved things I have status um, I'm responsible over things I have uh, character and reputation that 
and an identity that, that people look up to. Um, and, and I will work on that. Um, and finally, um, self-actualization is considered sort of the highest level personal growth and fulfillment this is once we have our, our food our safety our family once we have a job then we can work on peace with ourselves and you know that time spent meditating that time spent at the gym um, think of it like that um, now, now sometimes these do not always go in this order. Sometimes we have those who are poorest among us seeking uh, spiritual growth. Okay, but Maslow, I think, was on to something here. Um, later added cognitive and aesthetic needs. Okay, cognitive needs and aesthetic needs. So the, the idea that we need knowledge, meaning, and um, being self-aware, and we need some sort of uh, beauty in our life. We need um, nature, and we need some sort of balance. Um, and this is sort of like stability, but this is um, on a you know we need things to look good. Um, so maybe some of you have I've lived in about ten places in the past ten years. Um, and, you know, one thing I, I've realized um, as I took this, this full-time professorate um, position um, at Athens, I, I decided I did not want to live in what we call the student ghetto anymore. I did not want to live in a tiny apartment that people had trashed over and over and over again. There are holes in the walls. And um, I wanted, and I knew this would, was, it was an extra thing. Um, but I wanted some some sense of beauty to my apartment. Uh, I I didn't use those words, um, but I wanted it to to feel like home, a little more than just a box um, that I stayed in. Um, and some of you, you know, some of you, when shopping for a car, I've I've had to make the same decision, and it, uh, you know, obviously depends on money and and at that stage in our life. But are we searching for you know, a car that drives? Um, or are we searching for something beautiful? You know, the, the sexy car, the fast car, um, the car with all the, the gadgets and gizmos, right? Um, so, deficiency needs are when actualization needs are not salient. Okay, deficiency needs. Actualization needs are not salient. When it is not important, uh, we call that not being salient. Um, if they're not relevant at that point, then we focus on the other needs, the deficiency needs. Uh, actualization is adding something to our life. But most of the needs we saw here more deficiency needs, things that are missing. Um, we're going to separate these two ideas, being and growth needs. What types of things interfere with your motivation to learn course material? Uh, we talked about how do your motivational in interferences align with Maslow's theory? Which needs are not being met? Um, in order for you to be and to grow um, and we'll get into that further um, but we we'll think about what holds you back um, of course if, if you haven't eaten um, if you haven't had um, if you aren't peaceful if your mother's in the hospital you're not going to be able to learn so remember that being and growth needs are more of the the upper end of the um, hierarchy and then deficiency needs are basically the rest of them whatever is lacking um, 
that, that Maslow wrote about in his book, uh, Motivation and Personality. Um, so basically the only being in growth need you, you need to really be really um, thoughtful of is self-actualization, that personal growth and fulfillment that we may search for. Okay, self-determination or SDT theory, um, self-determination theory. Um, involves a number of things. Um, two main concepts that I want you to understand are what and where are, motiva are motivational incentives, what they are and, and where our motivation comes from. Uh, these two key concepts are, are the idea of our motivation coming um, from inside ourselves, being personal, and um, or is it is it less personal? Um, and let me let me give you an example to help you with that. An intrinsic um, motivation that I have is to read a fiction book. I enjoy reading a book of fiction if I get to pick it out, and I want to. I get joy from it. I will turn the pages on my own because I want to. It is something I'd rather be doing than this video, maybe. It is something you'd probably rather be doing. Um, if you get to pick the book out, and uh, you know, you probably have plenty of things that you you would go out and you would enjoy right now doing um, without anybody forcing you to do them. You are motivated to do those intrinsically. They provide their own intrinsic rewards, that joy you have, the smile, the laughter, whatever. Now, there's a place you go to make money. It's called work. Maybe some of you really enjoy that, but some of you just go so you get a paycheck. You are extrinsically motivated to go to work by the paycheck. It is an extrinsic reward. Some of you might want to ruin my day and make me read my book. You can change my intrinsic situation, intrinsically motivated situation of reading that book that I'm enjoying and say, Dr. Gooden, do a book report on that book. Say, ah, you just ruined it. Now it's for a grade, it's for competition, there's pressure from an outside source. Um, to, to read this, I'm now extrinsically motivated to do it. I have to do it. It's not for me anymore. It's not for my own enjoyment. So DC and Ryan talked about these two key ideas. Um, and then they talked about three basic human needs that are really important as we learn. The idea to become and feel competent. To have autonomy in our learning environment and to not do it alone, uh, to be within a community, to be working alongside each other um, in some way or, or in conjunction with our teacher, to have some sort of feeling that we're connected to somebody. Okay, and this is a bit thrown together here, but I, I think you can read it, um, non-self-determined. Um, to self-determined. What I want you to understand here is that this is a continuum. And this is a sub-theory of self-determination theory. Okay. And it's called the OIT, the Organismic Integration Theory. And it's, it's really quite interesting um, if you don't think about the big words. It really has to do with the idea that Things are on a level from no motivation at all. I'm not motivated at all. In fact, when I'm not motivated at all, I have to use volition, right? Volition. But when I start to get motivated, it's pure pressure at this level. And then as I head in this direction, according to the chart, I become more, it becomes more internalized, more joyful and to where it's completely personal and self-motivated or as it says self-determined at this level what we call intrinsic regulation I'm doing it on my own apart from anybody telling me I have to do it policeman doesn't tell me I have to do it 
mom doesn't tell me I have to do it. The religion doesn't tell me, hey, this is a good idea. And so there are all these levels of, and I, I'm not asking you to memorize them. I'm asking you to understand this is the level of a motivation, which means lack of motivation, where non, it's not self-determined. We have no self-regulation. We're basically pushed into whatever we are doing. It's not even motivation. We're not motivated by threat. We're just forced to do something. That would be a motivation. When we get into across this threshold towards extrinsic motivation, where we have many levels of extrinsic motivation, external, interjected, identified, integrated, and then finally we reach intrinsic motivation. And understand that sometimes, say you join the military, and some of you um, may have been in the military or may come from military families, sometimes that first push-up you do is not fun. It's it's purely maybe it may be forced, but um, you know you'll get yelled at or or something like that. Eventually, the rules of society or whatever system you're in become ingrained, interjected. You you realize, hey, this is important. Hey, I identify with the military. I I, I see this is important. I want this to be part of my life. In fact, I'm going to do it on my own all the time. Um, and then that's why apparently people do push-ups. Um, <laughs> I don't do that many. Um, so I want you to understand this continuum. Overall, this is um, sort of a graphic that is showing organismic integration theory. The idea um, that we move from a motivation to extrinsic motivation onto intrinsic motivation, or that we can, and that um, all motivated behavior can be seen on this continuum. Okay, so I've talked about extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. How might you, as an instructor, teacher, trainer, how might you facilitate or support intrinsic motivation? Describe a scenario. You may want to take a moment, pause the video, write this down. How might it work? What might be the process? What can you do in your classroom, in your gym, in your workplace to foster some sort of intrinsic motivation? At least to, to mix intrinsic rewards in with the extrinsic rewards. And then there comes the question of which is better. Is, does intrinsic motivation produce better performance? Well, in many cases, yes. There are so many situations in our lives where there just cannot be rational, logical, extrinsic, um, sorry, intrinsic rewards built for things. We're going to go to, you need to go to class. Well, I don't want to. Okay. How can I make you want to? Um, maybe if, if there were um, just, you know, candy, lots and lots of candy and money everywhere. Well, those are still extrinsic rewards, but you understand some situations cannot be made, quote, fun. Um, when might extrinsic rewards help to induce intrinsic motivation? What does that mean? An extrinsic reward might help lead to intrinsic motivation. Describe a scenario. Well, sometimes we have to, like, you know, it's it reminds me of getting a child to eat something that they've never tried. Uh, eat those green peas. Uh, they look funny. Or those black eyed peas. Uh, they, they look funny. They, they got black eyes. Okay. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you do it the first time and maybe you're like, hey, I actually enjoy this. Um, that military example I used. Um, may also be a good example. Describe a scenario for yourself. Again, I'm asking you to form your own examples. And describe a scenario, how might this work, and what might be the process for an extrinsic reward helping induce intrinsic motivation. You need to understand these terms. You need to understand how motivation works. There are two key components, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation, two main types. And they're built around these needs, competence, autonomy, 
and relatedness. Okay, next I will get further into motivational theories. Um, I'll be back with you soon, Dr. Gooden. Thank you.